Hi! Um, apologies that I haven't uploaded anything for a really long time. Um, things have been super busy. However, um, I've had a request for substance dualism um, and also that's where I'm at with my own students. So it makes sense to, to have a little go at that. So um, a disclaimer as always, this is purely um, for the AQA specification. So we are focusing um, only on Descartes um, and Descartes substance dualism. Um, sometimes known as Cartesian substance dualism. Um, so yeah, let's just get into it. Descartes um, is going to give us two arguments for substance dualism. Um, the indivisibility argument and the conceivability argument. I'm going to do it in the reverse order this, just because that's how I like to do it. Uh, and also I think it's, it's really important to understand where Descartes is coming from this. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background to what he's doing. So he paints a really nice picture um, of his old view of mind and body and his new view of mind and body. So before he commenced the meditations, so you've got your um, method of doubt, um, and in that method of doubt, he doubts everything he possibly can, which includes his body. Up until that point, he had believed that it was his body that was certain. He said that, okay, it's my mind that's uncertain. My mind is like some kind of wind, flame or vapour. I don't really know what it is. I don't know how to explain it. But bodies, I know about them. I can see them. I can touch them. They're the things that are certain. But the method of doubt flips it. So the method of doubt means that the body is uncertain um, because of the evil demon, even because of the dreaming argument, he can doubt his body. But he can't doubt his mind, the kagito. It's that positive solution to the method of doubt is the idea that the mind is easier to know than the body. It's the mind that's certain and the body that's uncertain. So what he used to think was essential were bodily functions. You know, I have to eat, I have to sleep, I have to breathe. If I don't, I'll cease to exist. But now he sees these things as not essential. So the body is not essential to him, um, whereas the mind is. If he ceased to think, he would cease to exist. So we have this flipping of what's important and what's essential, which is, is quite important to understand. The other thing that's really important to understand is what a substance is. So substance dualism, um, proposed by Plato, proposed by Descartes, proposed by Richard Swinburne, is the idea that the mind is an ontologically distinct substance. So the mind is not reducible to the body or any part of it. It exists as a substance in its own right. Uh, so to, to understand what a substance is, a substance is the bearer of properties it can survive a change in those properties, um, but it itself does not need those properties to, to exist. So if you think about the difference between substance and property, red is a property. It has to be attached to a substance and it cannot exist without that substance. So if you try to conceive of red independently of any other thing, you can't do it. For example, like rounds, you have to have a round something. It can't exist in its own, in its own sense. So roundness is a property not a substance. So what we're going to get to with substance dualism is the idea that mind is this ontologically distinct substance. It can exist independently and it doesn't need, it's a bearer of properties, but it's not itself um, a property. So for, for Descartes, for Plato, for Swinburne, you've got the thinker, which is the substance, and the thoughts, which are the properties. So the thinker is the permanent thing, and the thoughts change, they come and they go, and the thinker owns these, prop uh, these properties, which are the thoughts, uh, and can survive a change in them. You know, our thoughts are changing all the time, uh, and yet it is, this, it is something that survives all of that. Um, I won't be discussing Plato here, because obviously it's just purely Descartes. Um, Richard Swinburne's worth a look, if you have the time. Shameless plug here, but if you want to read about Richard Swinburne's substance dualism, check out my article in Philosophy Now, Swinburne separations. You can just go online and um, get that as one of your four free articles a month, I think. Um, ridiculously complicated. I don't think I understand it anymore. Um, but substance dualism is it's hugely unpopular now in academic philosophy. So I think um, according to Richard Swinburne, you know, about one percent, two percent of, of academic philosophers are substance dualists. But I guarantee that at some point you've probably thought like a substance dualist. So if you believe that the mind could survive bodily death, that there was something that was not reducible to your body. So when, you know, a, a loved one or a pet um, ceased to physically exist, if you believe they carried on somehow, then you were thinking like a substance dualist, that the mind can exist independently of the body um, and is a substance in its own right. So what we've got 
with these separate substances is Descartes says the mind is a thinking unextended substance. Um, it, it, it takes up no space. It's not made of matter. Whereas the body is brute. It's not intelligent. So if something's a brute, we tend to think of it as unintelligent, um, you know, just kind of passive and physical. Um, and bodies take up space. So they're extended and they're made of matter. Um, and they're also the bodies are divisible and the mind is indivisible, which will become important um, shortly. So that's that's known as Descartes' real distinction between mind and body. Um, and he's a radical substance dualist. So the mind can exist completely independently of the body. He's also an interactionist. So mind and body have this two way interaction. Mental, uh, mental events affect physical, physical effects mental. That is the, the issues with interaction, I think, deserve a separate video. If you were to need that, just pop it in the comments now. I'll just see what I can do. Um, but for now, what I want to focus on are the arguments for why the mind is this separate substance. Um, yeah, so like I say, um, kind of in common thought, substance dualism has, the, has a, a, a very important appeal, I think, and something people want to hold on to. But it's very hard to defend. Now, if you check out the AQA specification, it seems a little intimidating, the, the Descartes stuff, and um, particularly conceivability. You've got this kind of these very complicated issues. So I'm going to try and break that, that down as best I can. Um, hopefully that will work. And if it's something you can just replay, hopefully it will sink in at some point. So conceivability then. Um, Descartes does this with reference to God, but your specification wants you to do it without reference to God. So let's just start off with Descartes' version. He says, I have a clear and distinct idea of mind as something separate from body, as mind as an intelligent, immaterial, unextended thing, which is completely separate from this extended, brute, material body. Now, anything I can conceive of, God can make happen. He can do anything that I can conceive of. He can do all these, all these possibilities. Now, if it's possible for mind to exist without body, then mind cannot be the same substance as body if it's got it it's got to be a separate substance if i can conceive of it i can't conceive of property separately from any particular substance if i can conceive of mind independently it has to be a separate substance so if i'm trying really hard to think of squareness or coldness or redness independently of any particular substance i can't do it and yet i can do that with mind so all you need to do really is, is do that without reference to god so substances exist um, independently. They are not dependent on anything else for their existence. If I can conceive of mind separate from body, then it is possible for mind to exist separately from body. If it's possible for mind to exist separately from body, it is a distinct substance. Um, otherwise, I couldn't conceive of it. So find a way to pop that into one premises to conclusion. Um, you know, use your lay swing textbook or whatever it is for that. But you're looking at this idea that you're going from the fact that you can, can clip or well, Descartes can clearly and distinctly conceive of mind separate from body, that it is a possibility. If it's a possibility, then it has to be a distinct substance. Now, the way that I think of the issues is almost like a dialogue with Descartes, because in my head, I would have that. I would sit down and I would talk to him. Um, and you kind of say... You, you kind of criticise them stage by stage. So the first thing is you say to Descartes, well, actually, mind without body is not conceivable. So Descartes claiming this clear and distinct idea of mind dis uh, as a distinct substance. And you say, well, actually, is it? Is it that clear? So let's think about what that is like. So like I said before, lots of people at some point have had the idea of the mind um or the soul usually being distinct from the body disembodied consciousness so you go to heaven and you look down on your loved ones um, and you're this kind of soul what would that be like how would you perceive the world if you were a disembodied consciousness because something non-physical immaterial has no location so this idea of kind of you know sometimes people think about outer body experiences and looking down on their body from where exactly with what so how you, you have no eyes, you have nothing physical, you have no extension, you have no location. How do you perceive the world? How would you recognise any other loved ones? How would you know where one mind began and ended? So, you know, if, you, if you're in a room with several other people, if they've got physical bodies, you can see where those physical bodies begin and end. 
if they were just immaterial minds, how many souls would be in that room? Where, where would they begin and end? Because they can have no beginning and end because they have no extension. Now, I'm not saying that disembodied consciousness is not a possibility because it would be exceedingly arrogant of us to say, well, I don't get it, so it doesn't happen. We can't do that. And yet I think Descartes starting point of it being a clear and distinct idea it is not necessarily true. You know, I certainly don't have a clear and distinct idea of what disembodied consciousness would be, despite the fact that we might throw these ideas out, um, you know, in terms of heaven and souls and so on. When you actually break it down, it's not it's not clear. So Descartes starting point, I think, is is faulty there. The second point is this complicated phrase that what is conceivable may not be metaphysically possible. So what this is saying is just because let's let's grant for now Descartes that he's conceived it clearly and distinctly. So Descartes might come back at us and say, well, you might not have a clear and distinct idea of it, but I do. So let's say, okay, fine. But even if you can conceive of it clearly and distinctly, that might not mean, may, mean it's a possibility. You can actually conceive of things that are not possible. Now, a nice example of this is what is called the masked man fallacy. So in the masked man fallacy, then you, you see a masked man rob a bank and you have a, an idea that that is a masked man and he's a bank robber. I also have an idea, clear and distinct idea of my father. And I have the clear and distinct idea of my father, not as the masked man who robbed the bank. So I have a clear and distinct idea of these things as two separate entities. Let's say, unbeknownst to me, that my father is the masked man. Well, if he is the masked man, then it's impossible for him not to be the masked man because he can't be and not be at the same time. So if A equals A, it's impossible for A not to equal A um, because that's how it is. So if he's a masked man, he is the masked man and it's impossible for him not to be. So I've actually clearly and distinctly conceived of something that is not possible. So actually, regardless of his idea, he may be conceiving of something that's not possible just because he's got the idea of mind and body being distinct doesn't mean that they can be. I, I quite like the example, um, I, I always think of like a really bad chemist and the really bad chemist believes that water is H3O and that H2O is something completely different. So the really bad chemist has this idea of H2O and water being completely distinct things and yet if water is H2O, it's impossible for water not to be H2O. So the chemist is conceiving of something impossible. There are, there are responses to this. I mean, Descartes could say, well, actually, you don't have a clear and distinct idea of your father, because if you did, you'd understand that he was the last man. So that's on you. You may, you may or may not agree with that, but let's move on to the next stage. Let's just say, for argument's sake, that it is possible that mind is distinct from body okay so we actually grant Descartes the first two stages we grant that he can conceive of it we grant that it's actually possible well your third stage your third criticism is so what it all Descartes succeeded in doing is showing that it's possible that mind is a distinct substance but logical possibilities don't tell me about what's true of this particular world so it, it may be possible that mind is a distinct substance but what if I can also conceive of mind being the same as the brain? Well, both are possibilities. I actually just need to get out into the world and experience it in order to know which is true of this world. So what is logically possible tells us nothing about reality. It tells me that in some possible world, yeah, mind could be distinct from body. Well, mind is distinct from body, but it doesn't tell me about this one. I need to actually use empirical evidence to know whether mind is distinct from body or whether mind is identical to body. And actually, the empirical evidence points towards it being identical to the brain. So what we're doing here is we're just stage by stage picking at Descartes' argument. It doesn't, just because there's problems with Descartes' argument, it doesn't mean substance dualism is false. Um, but it does mean that he hasn't given us a good argument for why it's true. So it, it, it does seem a tricky one, that, but just break it down and take his argument stage by stage okay, and the issue stage by stage. Now, the next one is his indivisibility argument. Now, for this, you need to understand Leibniz's principle of the indiscernibility of identicals. Um, that just kind of rolls off the tongue so easily. Um, and what this is, is it's, it's Leibniz's claim that if you are claiming that sort of two things are actually one thing, or you're claiming an identity between things, 
then they have to have identical properties. So for a long time, we thought that there were two stars, the morning star and the evening star. So the last star um, left in the morning was the morning star. The first star out at dusk was the evening star. And we thought they were separate entities. And then we discovered that actually they're the same entity. Now, if we're claiming that identity between these two things, that actually they weren't two things, they were one, they have to have identical properties. So if the morning star was slightly bigger than the evening star, they can't be the same. Now, what Descartes does is he picks out on a very specific difference between mind and body. And he says the mind is indivisible, whereas the body can be split into parts. He says, I can lose any part of my body, be it a hand or a foot, yet nothing is taken from my mind. Now, my mind does different jobs, but it can't be split. It's not that kind of thing. You know, you can't chop up at something that's you know unextended. It doesn't take up any space in the first place. You can't divide it into physical parts. So because they have these, these different properties, one is divisible and one is indivisible, they cannot be one and the same thing. My mind has to be distinct from my body in a separate substance. Okay, now you attack this on two levels. The first level is to say, actually, the mind is divisible. Um, and, you know, if you're good at psychology, then they might find this bit a bit easier. Um, examples I use are things like split personality. Um, if you damage the brain, or if actually if you... They used to sever parts of the brain, the left and the right side, for things like treatment of epilepsy. Um, they did a horrific experiment with, um, with a, a monkey where they, they severed the brain, sort of they split between the left and right, um, and the monkey literally had two minds in one body. So they put a peanut in one of its hands and it just it fought with itself. It was just horrible. Um, but you do have these instances of apparently having two minds in one body. Um, you can take the Freudian approach. He split the mind into id, ego and superego. So there's ways to suggest that, you know, and also this links to neuroscience because damage to the brain appears to be also damage to the mind. So if you, you know, if you damage the frontal lobe, it could affect your personality. If you look at a brain that has dementia, then, you know, it not only has it physically deteriorated, but that you are lo literally losing parts of the mind. So the mind seems to be much more divisible than Descartes gave credit for. The other way to attack that is to say that there are there are physical things that are indivisible. So when you get to subatomic level, you've got these um, the smallest um, components can be best understood as these packets or force fields of energy that can't be split. So not everything that's physical is divisible. So you've got two ways to attack Descartes here. You can say, well, actually, the mind is divisible or you can say the mind is could be an indivisible yet still physical thing. Um, and that, that's another way to understand it. So again, this divisibility doesn't, doesn't give you a good argument for, for dualism. Um, there's another one that you might want to use, which is the argument from doubt. So if you've got a copy of the meditations, oh, by the way, this one's not on the spec. It just, it's just useful if you're doing an essay on dualism. You might want to throw it in. Um, so if you've got a copy of the meditations, um, you've got usually the first part of it is the discourse on the method, which he wrote first. And then the second part of it is the, the meditations. Um, by the way, I really like old books. This is a copy of Descartes' Meditations. Grace Coombs from King's College, London in 1905. I think that's amazing. Um, that's, yeah, well, anyway, I love that. So in the discourse, he presents this other argument from doubt. So what he says is it's similar to Leibniz's principle of indiscernibility because the mind and the body have separate properties. I can doubt the body, but I can't doubt the mind. Now, again, this is not a good argument for dualism because just because doubt is a property of me, it's not a property of what's out there. So let's say I work with Clark Kent um, and I know that Clark Kent exists. I can't doubt him, but I do doubt the existence of Superman. Well, that's about me. In actual fact, Clark Kent is Superman. They're identical. Just because I can doubt one and not the other, doesn't mean that they're separate entities. So it may well be that I think I can doubt the body and not the mind. It shows nothing about what's out there in the world. So if you want to throw that in there as well, that's fine, but they're not going to ask you on that one directly. So yeah, so we, what, what's come of this is we don't have a good argument for substance dualism. Now, not only that, but if you are a substance dualist, you've got to solve the problem of other minds. Similarly to if you're a property dualist, You've got problems of how these two things relate. Interactionism has its problems. Epiphenomenon has, it pro has its problems. Again, I can do something on that if you, if you need it. Um, having said that, uh, 
substance dualism is the only one that really accounts for free will because if you make the mind something physical uh, then you have real trouble with free will so there are, there are appeals to it um, yeah so hopefully that helped a little bit um, we can talk about the other things in separate videos um, but just remember that just because we don't understand something doesn't mean it's not true it just means that we don't yet have a good argument for it and I personally am hoping to find some argument for substance dualism that works because I would really like it to be true. So I'll see you soon. Um, let me know what else you need um, and I hope that helps.